Hello and welcome to the Daily Mill for Sunday the 5th of February 2023. In today's Mill news, we have the four takeaways piece from the South London Press. Here we go. So four takeaways from Mill's 1-1 draw against Sunderland. The pack then leads lonely players like he has a point to prove and the ref is in the spotlight. Richard Corley provides his takeaways from Mill's 1-1 draw against Sunderland yesterday. A packed den, a crowd of 18,524 were in attendance at the den, the biggest turnout since 1995, and the third highest gate since the stadium was open. Apparently, I, I haven't checked this out, it's our highest crowd for a league game ever, which is, I think the games that they're comparing it to were... The biggest turnout since 1995, I told you in yesterday's video, was the uh, Chelsea Cup game um, in the FA Cup when we played out a 0 nil draw and then went to uh, Stamford Bridge. Remember that? That was a good old time, wasn't it? Um, but I think our largest crowd at the New Den was against Oldham at Athletic, the last game of the season where we absolutely smashed him. And the North Stand, the away stand, was full of Mill fans. And they moved all the older Netflix, uh fans, all like, uh, what, probably like 100 of them, up into uh, Block 1, just under the um, control centre. And uh, that was the previous, I think, biggest attendance for a league game. Although I haven't checked that out, but someone said that uh, on the internet, so it may or may not be true. So with Sunderland having both tiers of the away end, the noise generated from all four sides of the ground. Definitely seemed to add even more energy and impetus from both teams and the first 45 minutes. Very frenetic. Now, did that work against us, though? Well, because I think it'll get onto that later, but the referee, he kind of uh, got caught in the headlights. Uh, got a bit like Billy Big, but Big Spuds and felt like he had to counteract the ferocity of the Mill crowd. It was a decent, if bruising, game of championship football between two sides that looked like they will be in the mix for the playoffs. Millwall extended their unbeaten league run at the den to nine matches and actually moved up the place to seventh after their first draw of 2023. Richard Corley would be very good if he was your teacher at school and your report card. This is putting a bit of a rosy spin on it. It's a bit very rosy spin on it. Our first draw of 2023, I don't know if you check this, we've only won once in, I think it's like five of our last home games. Four draws, so we are undefe we are undefeated, but four draws and one win. We beat Rotherham, we drew against Bristol City, we drew against Hull, we drew against Wigan, and now we've drawn against Sunderland. That's not the best, so... Uh, did the ref get the big calls right? Yeah, here we go. So Lions manager Gary Wright felt the answer to that was no. Uh, I think there were about uh, 16,000 people in the crowd that felt the answer to that was no. Uh, the first big call for official Thomas Brammel came early on as Tom Bradshaw went down inside the box. The middle frontman did well to stay on his feet as A.G. Alessi looked to shoulder him off the ball and then the Sunderland fullback immediately had his arm on Bradshaw's right shoulder before he hit the turf. There was an even more blatant shirt pull on Jake Cooper in the second period. As the centre-back tried to make a run to meet Zion Fleming. Long throw. The centre-back isn't looking for protection. He's big enough to look after himself. There are a steady stream of fouls that simply aren't given to him. Bramwell did little to make himself more popular when he, he uh, disallowed George Honeyman's goal in the 29th minute. Uh, I've attached a still the key moment. That's above. The assistant referee ruled that George Savile was impeding Anthony Patterson's line of sight um, for Fleming's shot. Fumbling it for Honeyman to be left with a straightforward tapping, probably the right call. Uh, Patterson made a fine save to deny Honeyman in the second half, but the Lions failed to make the most of their openings, particularly in the second period when they built up some momentum. They had 14 efforts, 9 more than the Black Cats, but only 2 ended up on target indeed. Uh, Sunderland created very little, and that's the other thing that made the results sting. George Savile was one of Mill's strongest performers, making the most attempted tackles 11 of any player. 
but he showed his frustration after catching Patrick Robertson conceding the foul, the Sunderland winger actually checking away from danger when he was brought down. Uh, Alex Pritchard's free kick was in exactly the right area. George Long opted to come and try and punch, but only made contact with Dennis Serkin. The fact that the Sunderland sub got to the ball first ensured there was nobody on the line to keep out his header. Yeah, just talking about that. Um, so, since going to the game, look, looking back at the highlights and seeing what led up to that um, free kick being conceded and them getting that goal. And you can see Joel Shavels running all up, following everyone around the pitch, trying to get the ball. He's not getting any help from anyone else. Bradshaw eventually just does like slowly run back. And that's not his fault because he was knackered. And in the 80th minute, where's the substitution? Get him off. Get him off. But Gary Rao, I think he was waiting because he wanted to bring on the defensive subs. And he was waiting, and as soon as that goal went in, he's like, oh, no. Now he has to bring on the attacking players. But if he'd have done that anyway, if he would have brought Vogel Samuel on for Honeyman and, and Burke on for, for Bradshaw, they would have been fresh legs, and they would have been coming back and helping Savile out to get the ball back off of first. And then in the middle of the pitch, and he wouldn't have been frustrated and gave away that free kick. But uh, it's all lips and butts, isn't it? But my opinion, I think that's a factor there. So injury woes, but Cresswell impresses. Uh, Mill's squad lacks the depth of some of their playoff chasing rivals. Now Mason Bennett has joined Callum Styles on the sidelines. Bennett's injury looked a serious one. The Lions attacker had his right leg in a protective brace when he was stretched off at half time, and the fear is that he suffered a fracture. Sean Hutchinson also missed out at the weekend. I thought it was a groin issue. Groin issue, did Gary Rout said. But Charlie Cresswell struggled to command at regular game time was excellent. Cresswell won two tackles in quick succession in the lead up to Honeyman's disallowed goal and also uh, produced a Tony Craig esque celebration after a perfectly timed slide after Roberts had produced a surging run and shot. Uh, the Leeds Lonely uh, played like he had a point to prove. More of that, please, indeed. Indeed. And yeah, Mason Bennett there, kind of sad for him, but. Uh, you get to the point where you got to think, is it worth it, mate? I mean, just retire and become an estate agent or just do something and get a happier life. Having your physical body just keep breaking down like this, it's, it can't be good for you. Just, get, just give football the heave and just do something better with your life, which probably not what you want to do and what, what you want to hear, but um, in terms of what's actually good for you and your life maybe that's what you need to do can't keep just getting injured every, every six months and battling your way back it's, it's not good for you uh, so we've got this as well from London who's online the South London Press's online website uh, Millwall midfielder Honeyman got it after being denied a goal against his old club Sunderland uh, George Honeyman described himself as gutted after seeing his first half goal struck off in Mills 1-1 draw with Sunderland yesterday. Uh, the midfielder thought he had put the lines ahead when he followed up to convert after keeper Anthony Patterson was unable to hold Zion Fleming's shot. But the finish was not allowed to stand with one of the assistant referees ruling that Jules Savile was offside and blocking Patterson's view. Apparently someone was impairing the goalkeeper's vision. A honeyman told me all TV. I'm not seeing it back, but I'm gutted about that because it was a flag. It wasn't a flag up straight away. It felt like half an hour before they chalked it off. Pat O pulled off a worldly against us in the second half. Maybe it just wasn't meant to be today. It was a proper game of football. It was really enjoyable to play in, and I hope it's enjoyable to watch because we packed it out and the atmosphere was class. Uh, these are the games you want to be involved in week in and week out. We're really disappointed because we take the lead and we're normally so good at holding on to that. So it's bittersweet. It was a brave header by the lad. But if we play like that for the rest of the season, then we're going to win more games than we lose. Or you could uh, draw more games than you lose because uh, that seems to be a situation that we're in at home now. We just draw and draw and draw and draw and draw. So let's crack on and get into it. Sunday, 
if you don't know, where have you been? A bit of a slow slow day Sunday because everyone's uh, taking a break after the game uh, yesterday and whatnot. So, in order to fill a video and get some content, we talk about the stats. So, here we go. This is infogold.net. And this is live actually. So if you're following the game, they update this live uh, for in-play betting purposes. You want to uh, do that kind of thing. In the middle above the red FT, you will see the XG. XG is expected goals. That is uh, how many goals that you will expect to score based on the on the quality of the chances you create. So not just how many, like we said, uh, he said earlier, how many shots we all had, and how many of them were on target. So base, it's not just one shot is equal. I actually give each shot a different uh, value based on where it is on the pitch. A short range tap uh, would have a higher value than a um, than a thirty five yard speculative uh, punt. And I think the highest XG is penalties. So basically a dead ball situation, uh, one on one, mano a mano in the area between a striker and a goalkeeper. That the XG for them I think is like 0 0.9. And that's standard. Although I'm not sure some of them probably change it based on who's taking them and who's uh, who's in goal. But so that's the situation. So if you look in the in the middle above the red FT, you see the XG for Millwall. Is 0 0.95, but the XG for Sunderland is 0 0.36. So very disappointing for Sunderland to get a goal with such low XG. Now it's not nothing, it's not 0, 0 0.0, which is what an XG we had a while ago at Blackburn away, which because we didn't have a shot on goal, which is embarrassing, but hey ho. So it's not nothing, and like if you sh if you shoot, you got a chance of scoring. That's how it goes. There is a slim chance, but for them to get a goal off of 0.36 and for us to get one goal of 0.95, uh, so you could say we got what we deserved, which is one goal from that XG, and they got more than they deserved, but you can't score half a goal, it's either 0 or 1, we're dealing in binaries here. So these, this here, a meal goal attempts over 90 minutes score. Of the match, quite a few, um, quite a few, um, quite a few in and around that D, the D area, kind of looking like um, constellation. What is it? Or Orion's belt, Orion, yeah, that one. You got them lined up there. The actual goal came from that one there, the one with the yellow ring around it. That was Jake Cooper. That was 15% probability of that going in, which was a shot from him lying on the floor. Although, I think I said yesterday that he got dragged out. He didn't get dragged down for that one, actually. He kind of just uh, ran in and jumped in and uh, bounced off the defender and fell over. So he wasn't dragged down for that one. But uh, he was on the floor prostrate and uh, sw swiped at it with his right foot and it went into the, uh, into the goal off of the post. So interesting stuff. So that's Millwall's goal attempts. Here's Sunderland's. Here's Sunderland's goal attempts. Five all game. Five. One from outside the area. That was at the end of the game. Four inside the area. Obviously the goal. The headed goal. 6% chance. But that wasn't their best chance. The best chance was Robertson 73. So it already sounds like most of those came took place in the second half. So let's have a look. First half for Millwall. Very slim. Six chances. Two for Sunderland. And we'll see when we go second half. So we did restrict them. 
fair fairness rating was that a fair result based on uh rating out of 100 82.66 so they're saying that was a fair result more or less um i guess but it felt like we should have won that game did we do enough to get two goals did we get enough chances to get two goals probably but more on that later so let's have a look now this is from youscore.com and if you look on the players on um uh, on the right hand side you've got Jade Cooper with the highest rating so you actually got man of the match based on the ratings from whosquad.com and the next two rated players are defenders for Sunderland so it probably tells you a lot about what went on there um, so if we go back to the middle you can see Mill will create a high number of chances relative to their possession with basically creating goal scoring opportunities for set pieces we're real aggressive and we've got caught offside often uh, we stole the ball often from the opposition. We're strong at uh, Sunderland. Stole the ball often from uh, the opposition. And we're strong at finishing. No shit. Um, commit a high number of individual areas though. Um, and then there's play styles. I'm not going to read them all out. So here's the attempts. Mill on the left in the orange and Sunderland in the blue on the right. That's how they do it. So we've got attempts. Mill will 14 to 5. 73 open play, 72 set piece. Which means that Millwall's one goal from 14 shots is a 7% conversion rate, and Sunderland's one goal from 5 is 20% conversion rate. They were mostly going down the right hand side, obviously, their star player Diallo. Um, shot directions, shot zones. Action zones, player positions, you can see them there banking up on the right, 16, 10, 28, banking up on their right hand side, and in terms of Millwall, you got, uh, what is that, Cooper number 5, getting himself forward quite a bit. And 39, which I think is Honeyman having to come back quite a bit and help out uh, Savile and Billy Mitchell. Mason Bennett playing a lot further forward. And he did alright. He actually did alright when he was fit and playing. He had a chance himself to score. Um, not that bad. So, let's have a look and see. So, here's the match events. Obviously, we've got. Cooper and Bennett getting yellow cards early on. We've got the substitution at half time. We've got yellow cards for them. We score. They respond to that by making substitutions, which don't pay off immediately, but do pay off in the end. And then we have Gary Rout responding to them scoring by bringing on attacking players when. If I'm going to be critical, like I've said it before, he should have probably brought them on earlier. I think the foul was caused by Savile getting uh, frustrated with the lack of pressure up front, the lack of legs up front and closing people down. And that manifested in, in the giving the free kick away, which manifested in the goal. Um, and then we've got them responding to uh, our substitutions with substitutions of their own. One was enforced, the geezer uh circuit with his head injury, I hope he's okay. Um but let's have a look. What who did what? So if you look at the club badges at the top left and the top right, you'll see the average player rating for each team, six point five eight for Mill, six point seven zero Sunderland. So despite what I said the other day, it does suggest that Sunderland what a better team. Well, you could say, well, they restricted a team with 14 shots on goal to only one shot, so that's pretty good. And you can see their defenders getting uh, the high marks there. So in terms of Mill, we've already seen Jake Cooper with the highest uh, rating, 8.0. Um, I think it's... 
if there is a flaw with this whoscored.com, I think they give ratings and scores based on productivity and what people do. One of the things is that he's winning aerials, winning aerial duels. Now, when you've got a player like Cooper, he wins them in defence, he wins them up front. So when he does that, he gets uh, points added to his rating, which kind of stacks him up. Uh, another thing that they do is goals. So obviously he got the goal, so then he's he did get the goal. Like, the strikers didn't score, he got a goal. So that's obviously helps boost his, boost his score as well. Um, but yeah. Murray Wallace hitting the crossbar. Um, but other than that, so we've got what have we got? We've got one, two, three players in sevens and above. We've got Bradshaw 6.2, we've got Jules Long 5.8, and I, I can probably guess what that's about because, as we saw, I think Sunderland had two shots on target and they've managed to get one goal, so that's 50%. He come out, he comes out to get the ball, ends up smacking the guy in the face, like right hook, left, right, good night, bang, knocked him out of the game, well that's great, but maybe next time you could get the ball and we could end up winning the game, that might be good, that might, that might, that might uh, be a bit, a bit better for us, thanks, thanks mate, um, so there's shots, who had the shots? So everyone, oh bloody hell! So everyone from Millwall had a shot except for the striker Bradshaw, McNamara, and the goalkeeper. Even the what, two of the three subs had a shot. So Bradshaw did not have a shot. Um, they had five. Uh, possession wise, forty two to fifty eight. Um, and Billy Mitchell, 5.6% of the match possession was for him. Um, and you can see for Sunderland, obviously, a lot more for them, especially down there at this right hand side. Pass success percentage, 65 to 82. Um, And that's another thing that types. So they're passing it between the defenders. You've got Bradshaw running around closing them down. Why are you waiting for the 84th minute before you take him off? Like, let's, let's think about what you're doing. And uh, use all of the available substitutions that you have because we don't have a big squad. Um, Honeyman actually up there with the most, uh, with the most successful passing. Although I wonder how many passes that will be off. Like 86 is normally Billy Mitchell, so that's 78. Uh, dribbles 2 to 20. So yeah, not ones for dribbling. But, uh, Sunderland love a bit of a dribble. Aerials won 22 to 20, and here we go. Jake Cooper with 11. Danny Ballard with 8. Danny was Bath with 6. Um, Mason Bennett, 3. In half of, half of football. So yeah, he won the most, his second most aerials. He was on the pitch for 45 minutes. Tackles, though, 29 to 19, which we had to because they were dribbling a lot. So. Savile with six, Honeyman with six. Again, Bradshaw with none. Bradshaw, no shots, no tackles, and everyone on the pitch won a tackle, except for Bradshaw, except for Long, and except for Burke, who cannot come on as a sub. Both of the other subs won a tackle. Corners, five to six, dispossessed. Basically means having the ball taken off you. Obviously more for them because they were dribbling with it. So that's how that, that kind of bumps up that, that situation. Um, now moving on to the player stats. And here we can see a bit of... Uh, so let's have a look at the ratings first. 
We've got Jake who was 7.99, just under 8. Oh, okay. So they rounded it up. We've actually only got one other player in the 7th. George Honeyman, 7.19. Um, and then it drops down to 6.99 for Zion. Uh, 6.95 for George Shovel. 6.85 to Billy Mitchell. And then it drops down a bit. In terms of uh, George Long, 5.79. Ouch. Ouch. So, yeah, let's see why that is. Uh, let's go down to Sunderland. Shots and shots on target for them. So, five shots from five different players, actually. And, oh, one on target. Ouch. So, 20% of their shots were on target, and it was a goal. Yeah, you, you can't be doing that, mate. If you're in goal for Millwall and you have only have one save to make all game, You've got to make it. You've got to make it. I mean, come on. What are you doing? Now. Uh, who had the most touches? Mitchell, Savile, McNamara, and then it drops, starts dropping off a bit. Massive drop-off between Mario Wallace and Tom Bradshaw. Um, in terms of mere wall, so we had ten different players having a shot. How many of them were on target? Like you, you're gonna really see, it's not good. Two. So what was that? Fourteen shots here. Yeah. So we have fourteen shots, only two on target. That is abysmal. That is truly abysmal. And one of them was a from a player who was lying down on the ground and couldn't even probably see the goal properly. Maybe that's the trick. Maybe you just got to shoot towards goal. Like, use the force. Jedi mind trick. Like you know where it is. Just shoot. Don't, like, try and line it up and get it all neat. And just hit it. And even if it's going off target, it might hit one of their defenders and go in. Uh, kind of weird. Uh, so let's have a look at offensive. They said we were offside a lot, so what happened there then? I suppose it is a lot, that is a lot. Five five offsides in a match. Obviously one of those was the goal, which was absolute fucking dog shit. So maybe, I haven't seen the rest of them, uh, maybe they were questionable as well, don't know. If we go to defensive work. Tackles, Savile, Honeyman, then it drops off. But everyone was getting involved in the tackling. Uh, interceptions, again, Savile, Fleming, Murray Wallace, Tom Bradshaw. So Tom Bradshaw did do something during that game. He had two interceptions and one clearance. And, and he gave away two fouls, okay. Uh, clearances, Mitchell with six, then Charlie Cresswell with five, Jake Cooper with three. Savile and Murray Wallace are two each. Blocked shots though. Well, there won't be a lot of them because they didn't have them that many shots. They had five shots. So they had five shots. One of them was on target and two of them were blocked. So that means they had two just go go wide, I guess. So there you go. Charlie Cressel and Zion Fleming now. Passing wise. So let's see George Honeyman. At the highest accuracy, yes. Well, that was off of 21 passes. I still think we've got to give it to Billy. Billy, 78% off of 41. That's that's up there. Uh, Cresswell, 31 passes, 74. That's decent as well. And then it just... This goes all right, doesn't it? Um... So let's have a look at crosses and accurate crosses. We've got Jules Savile 6 and 2, Honeyman 4 and 1, Billy Mitchell 2 and 1, um, Bobble Samuel 1 and 1. Long balls and accurate long balls. So George Long, obviously goalkeeper having a lot of long balls. 22 long balls off of these 20. 22 passes were long from these 24 passes. 
and only seven of them seven of them were accurate. So the only shot on target he failed to deal with, and he's only had seven accurate long balls off of twenty two, which makes his pass down accurate thirty seven point five. Fantastic. Yeah. Um, so we got Murray Wallace 12 and 5. All, all much of a muchness apart from Fleming with 4 and 1, which is not that good. Yeah. Um, what, you, what can you say? We need, to do, we need to do better up front. We need to be more clinical up front. But the players that he brought in to provide something more up front so you went with the same old same old and what happens the same old same old happened which is mason bennett's body breaking down into a husk and the strike bradshaw not having a single shot on target um not really doing anything apart from two was it two interceptions and two clearances so let's see what happens now Obviously, you you felt that he couldn't just throw those players in. So when was the transfer deadline day? It was on Thursday, wasn't it? Was it Thursday? Wednesday, Thursday. When or basically Wednesday night. Uh, so you, you got the feeling that he couldn't just throw them straight in. He had to go with out of what loyalty or something. Like if we were in relegate, like I suppose does. We we are challenging with the players that we've got. We are challenging, so you couldn't just bring the bring Burke and Watmer and just run in chain and say, yeah, just kick everyone else off and just say, oh these players are garbage because they're not. They did well enough to get into the playoffs, but Bradshaw now today, that's not good. So against QPR, are we going to see Burke? Are we going to see what more? Is SA going to get back in the squad? Because a lot of people weren't happy to see him dropped. For not really no reason. They figure he he provides a different dimension. He's got pace, but he can hold the ball up. He can run with the ball, dribbling-wise. Uh, when, when you've got Tyler Berry missing and then injured, he was the other, other person who could do that, uh, running directly with the ball and dribbling with it. Uh, which is something we probably need in in the final stages of the game to uh, come to counter attack, but um, we'll see. Um, now that we're going to have a week of training with Burke and what more, hopefully they don't get injured, because that would be an absolute kick in the face if they did get injured. Hopefully they don't, but then we look to next Q next week at QPR and the team selection. Um, and then we've got a midweek game against Coventry between that. So we'll see what happens. Um, what is what is the team selection based on this? This, this is a disappointing result in my eyes. Uh, there's some there's something's going on in the home games. Disappointing. Um, in terms of the last five home games, we've got four draws and a win. You would say, well, we'd, uh, at least we're not losing. Well, we, we should be beating Wigan. We should, we should be beating Hull when they have their stop, top strikers sent off. But we're not. And you could argue, well, this is this is a decent result in terms of we didn't lose against a playoff rival. But based on the shots that we had and the shots that they had, that I've just shown you here in the stats, based on the XG, we should have won that game. And you say, well, it's not because of the players, the referee, some people are saying that. Yeah, fair enough, but I mean, there are some individual uh, <clears throat> situations going on, say with George Long, Tom Bradshaw, that um, probably needed to be better. And we'll see um, if that happens in the next game at QPR away. Uh, Mill fans sold out their allocation, going to be well up for this. And we will see. QPR haven't won at home in six games. This is a winnable game for us. But we haven't we haven't won at QPR for like 20 years. So something's going to have to break. Either we 
win there and break our streak of being shit there, or they win and break their streak of, of not winning at home since October. And on that note, thank you for watching and goodbye.